Uh, I'm the museum educator here at the PA London Museum, and I'm delighted you're able to be with me today, whether it's in person or virtually. Um, and uh, Doc, if you want to share my screen. I do have some technical uh, support today. Our curator is Josh, one of my lovely assistant. So I want to thank him for handling the advancing of all my slides. Um, getting started. Um, so my presentation today is entitled Women and Woodhick, a historic look at women in the PA lumber industry. I want to advance to the, the next slide. Um, and to begin with, for those of you unfamiliar with the term wood hick, uh, let me explain. These are wood hicks. Um, wood hick was the term used in Pennsylvania to refer to the men working in the forest during the 1800s and the early 1900s, uh, what folks would refer to as loggers or lumberjacks today. Um, these images that you see are of the wood hicks uh, of the past doing a variety of tasks from cutting down trees, to skidding logs out of the wood, uh, to stacking logs to be transported by train. They work 10 to 12 hours a day, six days a week, from fall through spring to clear cut the forest of Pennsylvania. The white pines and eastern hemlock trees they cut, along with other species, would be turned into a vast variety of wooden products, while the bark from the hemlocks would be used in the tanning process to make leather goods. Good mind dancing to the next slide. Um, oops, that's one more. Oh, I'm sorry, this was the, the type of camp. I'm sorry, you are correct. The type of camp that they would have been living in, these very remote uh, logging camps. Uh, and if you visit the museum, we have a recreation of what one of those camps would have looked like. Um, so although the history of Pennsylvania's lumber industry has predominantly focused on men, if you look closely around the edges of these uh, logging camp photos, the next slide, or if you look at the group photos of factory employees here on the screen, you'll see the women were working in those worlds as well. A recent research has begun to bring these women out of the shadows and shine a light on the important roles they play. I'm going to talk about those roles and share the stories of a few of those women with you today. So working in a logging camp as a cook or a kitchen assistant, which was referred to as a cookie, was one predominant avenue open to women uh, for employment in the lumber industry. Food was of vital importance at logging camps. Uh, and a camp might have anywhere from uh, oh, 12 to 100 men or more working there. Because of the hard and strenuous work we did, wood hicks ate a lot of food every day. They could consume anywhere from 4,000 to 8,000 calories a day. Food didn't need to be fancy, but it had to be hot, plentiful, and tasty. Crews were willing to quit a camp and start working um, at someplace else of the issue of the quality and quantity of the meals. Cooks who could prepare on time good meals three times a day, seven days a week were in demand. As a result, a cook's position was one of the highest paid jobs in the camp although often the cook would then be paying the wages of his or her cookie out of their earnings. I mean, if you wouldn't mind the next photo. Um, uh, so uh, another image of uh, a table prepared and sort of a ghostly figure of a woman here. We're not certain who this woman is in the photo, but I do want to share with you um, the story of a woman named Anna Eckert. She was interviewed sometime between 1958 and 1976 by the historian and author Thomas Weaver. And she provides some really great insight into the work of women in the kitchen at a logging camp in the early 1800s. So she said, I had a girl who helped me. I cooked three meals a day, seven days a week. The girl took care of the table and cleaning up. I did the cooking. She helped feed them. We served breakfast at 5.30 in the morning when the men had far to go. They started work at 6 a.m. I got up before 5. I had almost everything ready. You had your meat cut and your potato sliced and everything the night before. You cooked the oatmeal and the pancakes. 
There were fried potatoes and beef in the summer mostly. In the winter, we had pigs, which were raised in the summer. We dished everything up in big dishes and put it on the tables. Everyone put the food on their plate. There was no separate little dishes. All the camps, at all the camps, dishes and cups were china. There was no metal. The supply train came out once a week. We ordered everything and they sent you out what you ordered. Everything came in tubfuls. We used the lard for frying and pies and cakes. We made pies of everything you had. You would bake a cake every day for breakfast and supper. In the winter, we baked everything and you baked every day. The main thing we had at dinner was potatoes and meat and soup and gravy. We had pie and cookies on the table. Dinner was the main meal. Supper had meat, potatoes, and fritters, or Johnny cakes, or something like that. After supper, had to clean up and get ready for the morning. Work until about 10 o'clock at night. The stove for cooking was about 12 feet by 4 feet. They burned wood. We always had a big iron kettle on the back of the stove with hot water for dishwashing. You had to carry the water uphill. The lazy men wouldn't do it. They never carried any water in or wood to the kitchen. In the afternoon, we had two hours spare time. I had the children and I washed. I got paid $18 a week and had to pay the girl. She paid her $5. That was good pay for the girl. Lots of them only got three to four dollars. I had children and she helped me there. Now, Anna herself was just about age 14 or 15 when she started cooking at a logging camp where her father was employed. Uh, a few years later, she married a gentleman named Henry Eckert, who worked at the camp as a teamster skidding logs with horses, and she got a job as a cook at his camp. Her description is pretty typical of the work taking place in a lumber camp kitchen. Up before the wood hits rise and in bed after the men, um, who would have gone to bed at 10, 10 p.m. Um, there's strong team that time management and organizational skills that were key to be able to prepare the quantity of foods required for a meal and to have it hot on the table. Having a cookie was vital because her responsibilities included washing dishes, waiting on tables, peeling vegetables, washing towels, linens, and laundry, hauling water and wood, calling the men to meals, and cleaning tables. Without assistance, those duties would have fallen onto the cook as well. Now, when Anna started um, to have children, she mentioned she had children, she continued working while raising her family at a logging camp. And this was not unusual. Men and women were giving birth and raising families at logging camps. Back to you on the next photo. <clears throat> so this image we have, uh, which I love, is of a woman named Alma Swanson. Her husband, Jake, was a jobber, and their camp was near Hull in Potter County. Now, for those of you unfamiliar, a jobber was the foreman of a lumber camp, basically the person in charge. He contracted for a job with this timber landowner, who was often a wealthy businessman or land prospector who lived, you know, sometimes in an urban place like Philadelphia, New York, Buffalo, or Erie, may never have even set foot on the land to be harvested. The jobber was the one who contracted to cut a defined tract of land over a specified period of time usually a, a year or two, um, and it would be a, an agreed upon price that was determined. The jobber owned most of the lumber camp equipment, so things like horses, saws, a lot of the tools, and they hired all the employees to work at the camp. In many cases, a jobber had to pay wages and, and equipment costs up front prior to receiving compensation from the timber owner for the logs that they cut. So as a cost-saving measure, a jobber might hire his wife and children um, to fill the role of cooking cookies to help save money. And based on the photo here, um, the other woman that is in the photo, so Alma is on the left, the other woman is identified the word cook is written by her pen. So clearly, clearly Alma was um, holding the role of cookie at her husband's camp while also raising the children who are in the photo as well. Then there's a few blurry images that we see sort of in the, in the foreground. <laughs> um, so recent research has shown that for some women who were born into families who operated logging camps, probably not surprisingly, they themselves would marry men in the lumber industry and go on to open and run camps of their own with their husbands. And this is certainly the case of Rose 
the Madar Gigantic Park. She is the little girl in the center sitting on the stump there. Her parents immigrated to Pennsylvania in the early 1900s. Her father worked as a woodcutter, but soon he and his wife became lumber camp operators who raised their family in their camp. As a young girl, Rose worked in the camp's kitchen, and she actually met her first husband, Joseph Kajanik, at her father's camp, and they married when she was 17 in 1925. They decided to immediately start their own camp, and so Rose found herself wet on a Saturday, and she was cooking, washing, cleaning, and sewing for a crew of 25 men the following Monday. Quite the honeymoon. Um, the Kajanics ran their camp jointly, and Rose didn't just do the cooking, but was known to frequently take on tasks in the woods, like removing trees, pulling the crosscut saw, and chopping wood. Um, this is her all grown up with her husband Joseph and their children. So the Kajanic family grew to include four sons, all born at their parents' remote logging camps. Unfortunately, tragedy struck the family in 1937 when Joseph was killed in a car accident. Rose was determined to carry on, and although offers were made to have her children placed with other family members or friends to raise, or to actually put all four boys in an orphanage, Rose chose instead to raise her young sons together as a family in the woods with the wood hips. She took over and continued running the lumber camp she and Joseph had started. She cooked and cleaned while also taking over the management of the logging operation, bossing the men, and managing the finances. Years later, her son Joe discussed the challenges his mother had faced. He said, this was an era when few women drove, let alone ran rough and tumble businesses and bossed men. But she did it and never made it look hard. She would do 10 jobs and never complain. I remember at times after my father died, I would hear her cry at night. She cried then because it was the only time she had. So one of Rose's granddaughters recalled that Grandma was a tough and good businesswoman. And that is an image of Rose in later years to the right. She worked from morning to night, completing the many chores needed to run the logging camp. The woodcutters at the camp respected her and knew she was the boss. I think the woodcutters were afraid to cross grandma. She could easily switch from English to Slovenian with a raised voice when necessary to get her point across and to express her displeasure. Rose Kajanik operated logging camps at several locations over the years. She decided to retire and remarry, however, in 1968, so she closed her last camp, which is pictured here on the left, um, it was located in Burningwell in the King County. Um, and what is really cool, I think, is believed that she actually operated the last active lumber camp in the state. How amazing is that? Yeah, it was mine. Now, uh, Pennsylvania's lumber industry, of course, is not limited to just working in the woods. A vast number of items were made, of course, from the trees that were cut down. Um, and uh, some of these manufacturing jobs became another avenue for women to gain, gain employment. In the 19th and early 20th century, America saw a real shift uh, with women starting to work not only in the homes, but to leave the homes and, and have active roles in different industries. So most of the manufacturing jobs in the lumber industry were exclusively for men, but there were two, the kindling wood and the clothespin factories, that were um, two exceptions, and they employed, um, in fact, the majority of them uh, in both of their uh, fields. Um, so, kindling wood is a common byproduct of the lumber industry. Kindling factories were built to use the waste lumber from sawmills, which were cut, it would be steam dried, and then it would be compressed into bundles. Um, and you can see a bundle there on the left. Bundles were shipped to cities like Philadelphia and New York, where wood was scarce, and they were used in coal stoves for heating and cooking purposes. The bundles were tied with a twine soaking wood tar to create a wick, and once the kindling was placed in the stove, the wick would lit to ignite the bundles and coal. Um, a typical bundle actually sold for three cents, or two for five cents. And uh, as I mentioned, the, the image on the left is of a real bundle, which is actually here in the museum collection on display. Um, it's probably one of my favorite things in the collection. 
uh, because it ties into not only lover history and women's history, but also it was meant to be destroyed and that it still exists. It's pretty cool. One of the things I love about museums and artifacts. On the right there, you can see uh, one of the bundles, a historic image. I was taken by one of the cook shows that would have been used to find it out. Really so, <laughs> a gentleman named Ilo Blaisdell was actually the inventor of the press that was used to create these Kinglin bundles. He and his seven brothers controlled a vast empire of Kinglin factories throughout the year. The Blaisdells hired both young men and women to work in their factories. Um, and uh, there's a description from about 1887-1888 about this Kinglin factory, which was located over in Austin. And I'm going to share it with you. It gives you some insight into the working conditions of their employees. Um, and the description was, there are a hundred bundling presses at the factory, so a hundred of these machines, which were mostly handled by boys and girls in equal numbers from ages 15 to 21 years of age. These presses were worked automatically by steam screw presses with a pressure in each bundle uh, before it was divided of 40,000 pounds. Really strong presses. The pressure and release is made by a simple touch of the foot of the bundler. The gearing of the presses are made to turn one half inward and one half outward, the side with the outward turn being for girls so that their skirts cannot be caught in the machinery. These children soon became experts. They bound seven to eight hundred bundles each day, while some very expert and nimble ones bound twice as many. They received 20 cents per hundred bundles, which is some excellent wages, at least according to the description at the time. So, um, uh, as key to that, work at the factory could be extremely dangerous. The machinery moved fast, with little room for error for the young people working there. Images of a few unknown employees of the Kinlin Bridge factory. Um, so the presses, as I said, ran automatically and wouldn't just shut off as a woman's skirt got caught in the press. She could be pulled into the machinery receiving harm or severe injury. Uh, the air would have been filled with sawdust and splinters were not just a nuisance, but a real hazard, particularly for the eyes. I do not think, I do rather think it's interesting that it appears that the employees received equal pay regardless of their gender, which was not necessarily the case in manufacturing jobs. Um, and if you were doing the math, they were making $1.50 to $1.60 a day or more, depending on their skill level. So the other major the other major manufacturing manufacturer employer and sorry, the other major manufacturer employing women uh, were closed in factories, um, which could be found across the lumber region as well. Um, Counter Sports, not too far from the museum, uh, had was the location of the Dodge Closed Pin Factory, and they employed 30 people there, 18 of whom were women, uh, and it opened in 1896. Among the women working there was the owner's daughter, actually, Rola, who was 17 years old. She and the other women uh, typically operated lathes and polishing machines, um, heavy, heavy equipment like uh, band saws, rip saws, slaughter containers, steam power plants, uh, the log pond, uh, the warehouse, those sorts of things would have all been the domain of the male employees there. Um, now these two, uh, if you wouldn't mind, Josh, uh, the, next, uh, uh, the next two images I have here are actually of a posting factory in Maxim, PA. And it shows the pins as they're being cut and turned. Um, so this was done very rapidly. And then the pins would have been dried and polished um, in revolving cylinders. Afterwards, they would have been boxed and shipped out all over the world. The capability of the Maxim Posting Factory was that they made 500 boxes a day. Each box had 720 pins. And so if you do the quick math, that is 3,600,000 closed pins. They were making the maximum each day. And it took one factory. So you can imagine the amount of closed pins getting out there into the world. Who would mind y'all?
So for a long while, Pennsylvania's forest and lumber industry seemed inexhaustible. When the Commonwealth's founder, William Penn, arrived back in 1682, an estimated 90% of PA's nearly 28 million acres was covered in century-old trees, enormous trees. In the 1860s, the Civil War and Western expansion created a tremendous demand for lumber, and the introduction of steam-driven machinery revolutionized the lumber industry. By 1870, Pennsylvania was the number one lumber-producing state in the nation, and the city of Williamsport became the lumber capital of the world, with more than 30 sawmills and a variety of other forest product manufacturers located there. By 1890, one billion, the one billion board feet of hemlock was cut and processed in Pennsylvania each year. <laughs> and of course, decades of this rampant lumber harvesting, however, eventually had major consequences for the forest. The industry practiced clear cutting, which was the removal of all tree species, leaving behind barren landscapes. By the 1930s, Pennsylvania forest cover had fallen to 30%. And the trees left were young and largely unsuitable for industrial or ecological use. The majority of the logging industry moved down to PA to go to other states, leaving behind things like this damaged and scarred landscapes, along with massive unemployment. So, some of the largely clear, clear cut northern tier of the state, where we are now. It was actually given the monocle of Pennsylvania Desert. Um, and the map here shows by 1895, the really dark colored, uh, hotter, machining, a little forest part of Cameron, like that desert, Pennsylvania Desert. The other sections are really just seeded of forest. So uncontrolled wildfires, loss of wildlife, soil erosion, and water quality issues were widespread in these areas. Now, as you can imagine, concern about what to do with this land, which most lumber companies considered worthless, led to an appropriation, actually, of money by the PA legislature to begin acquiring and develop state-owned forests, what they called at the time forest reserves. These forests would be managed by the state for timber production, for watershed protection, and for public recreation. Since the productive value of this land wasn't equal to the cost of property taxes, a number of individuals and timber companies were eager to offer their land to the Commonwealth for as little as $2 an acre. When land was offered for sale, its condition, however, had to be evaluated for the soil quality, for wildlife, forest potential, and for uh, recreational potential before it would be acquired. So in 1895, the State Forest Reservation Commission was created to do just that. And just a few years later, in 1901, Myra Lloyd Dock was appointed to this commission, becoming the very first woman to be appointed to a government post in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So Myra was born in 1859 to a prominent family in Harrisburg. Her mother's death when Myra was just 18 left her to manage the household and tend her younger siblings for the next 20 years. In 1895, at the age of 37, Myra had the opportunity to attend the University of Michigan and at last pursue her interest in science. She was an amateur botanist prior to starting college, and she hoped to prepare for a life in the laboratory. And she actually wrote, to have a lab and slave from morning to night in field work or with microscope was my dream of joy. Myra left the university a year later, however, without graduating. Although she never can clearly explain her motives for leaving, many obstacles existed for women in the 1890s who were interested in scientific careers. Universities at the time feared that women entering into certain fields would lower the salaries for their male graduates and lessen the prestige of their college programs. In 1899, she wrote in a diary that she kept. She, uh, referred indirectly to scientists who were afraid of learned women. So Myra instead turned her focus to becoming a public lecturer. She was armed with a new expertise and lantern slides. A few examples here that you see, they still exist. They're in the collection of the um, university. 
Um, so armed with her botanical slides, she started to travel throughout central Pennsylvania, speaking at uh, study groups, women's clubs, urban lyceums. She also began writing botanical articles for magazines. Through her writing and her lectures, she developed a large acquaintance among landscape architects, conservationists, and foresters. In 1899, she got the opportunity to travel to London as a speaker at the International Congress of Women to discuss what American women had accomplished in the field of horticulture. While overseas, she got to travel to Germany and toured the country for a month. She met foresters there, she toured tree nurseries, and she learned forest management principles. And when she returned to Pennsylvania, she began a drive, she became a driving force behind the city beautification movement down in Harrisburg. Gosh, she wouldn't mind. So her forestry and civic improvement work really propelled her to seek out appointments to the State Forest Reservation Commission in 1901. Her primary job as a commission member was in the inspection of the land offered up for purchase. She would travel by train to the town closest to the land she was to look at. She would rent a horse and buggy to drive to the often very remote site, and then she would inspect the land on foot. Her findings would be reported to the next commission meeting, and the vote would be taken on whether or not to purchase the land. Now, as a member of the commission, she did not pay the salary. So she's doing this for free but she did receive reimbursement for travel expenses. During her first year, 175,000 acres were acquired by the state. And by the time of her retirement from the commission 12 years later, nearly 1 million acres of land had been acquired. She was instrumental in founding Mon Elto, which is one of the first forestry schools in the United States. While forestry was a long established profession in Europe, it was practically unknown here in America until the latter part of the 19th century. As Pennsylvania acquired more land for forest reservations, it became quickly apparent that trained foresters needed to replant and manage the land, and the state would need to train its own foresters. Myra threw her efforts into lobbying the legislation to appropriate money to fund the school, and in 1903, Mom was open. She taught botany courses there from 1903 until 1929, and today, Mont Alto is part of the campus system at Penn State University. She also assisted, assisted in the founding of the Pennsylvania School of Horticulture for Women, one of the first horticultural schools to be established by and for women in 1911. The school provided women with theoretical and practical training in areas of horticulture, garden design, estate management, farming, and education to ensure women would have the skills needed to enter professional fields. She was a member of the school board for eight years and was a lifelong supporter of the school, taking pride in the opportunities it provided young women and the ways professional education empowered women workers. Myra Lloyd Dock was also an active women's rights advocate, becoming involved in state level suffrage organizations starting in 1899. Pennsylvania suffrage at this time faced a daunting battle against the Republican Senator Boise Penrose whose political machine was controlling the state. Penrose, who campaigned his contributions, actually came from the liquor interest, and he was afraid that if women could vote, they would help pass a federal alcohol as a prohibition amendment. So there was a fight to be had. Myra made speeches, organized meetings and rallies, and donated money to the suffrage cause. So in 1915, Pennsylvania suffragists pushed for a voter referendum uh, on suffrage to be placed on the ballot. Unfortunately, it got defeated at the polls. Now, looking here at the map, um, it shows each uh, county and the voting that went on, pro and con this issue in regards to suffrage. And I think what's really striking, except with a couple of counties, almost the entire lumber industry was in favor of suffrage for women, it was in favor of women voting. Meyer continued her work at the state level while her younger sister, Lavinia Dock, who was a member of Alice Hall's Congressional Union, she was pushing for national suffrage. Um, so there were two women, this was the organizations at this time. One really pushing for state by state, one working nationally, and um, they were really outspoken. And that was Alice Hall's group. So Lavinia, 
Myra's younger sister was 59, and she picketed at the White House in 1917 and 1918. Alice Paul and her group was taking the fight to protest. Uh, Lavinia was actually arrested three times. She re refused to pay the required fine and she served jail time. Myra would visit her sister while she was confined in a notorious workhouse in Virginia, and she was appalled that the unsanitary and inhumane conditions women were forced to live in. They were forced feeding women. Women were protesting by um, doing um, hunger strikes, and then women were being forced fed. It was an awful situation. Myra's appeals, along with public indignation, won Lavinia an early release. So in 1919, when the federal suffrage amendment passed the U.S. Congress, Pennsylvania became the seventh state in the nation to ratify the 19th Amendment to give women the right to vote. Myra Hope having the right to vote would provide a tool women could use as they strove for what she saw as the ultimate goal, which was equality and professional education and employment. Before we end today, I want to introduce you to one more really amazing woman who worked in Pennsylvania's wood, this lady right here, Mary Lee She was born in 1915 at her parents' lumber camp. Her mother, Rose, had just finished preparing breakfast for the wood hicks when she gave birth to Mary without the benefit of a midwife or a doctor. Her mom immediately went back to work, newborn Mary in her arms to prepare lunch and to finish the laundry. Mary and the eight siblings who came after her all helped with the chores around the camp. Mary recalled, if you weren't working, you were taking care of the younger children or learning how to sew and crochet. Tragedy, unfortunately, struck this family as well in 1936. Rose, Mary's mom, was preparing dinner when she lifted a large kettle off the stove of hot soup. While carrying it, she hit the edge of the sink and the soup spilled all over her, scalding her from the waist down. Rose was hospitalized for three days before she succumbed to gangrene infection and died. So shortly after her mom's death, Mary wed a gentleman named Joe Bezak. He was a wood hauler for the Day Chemical Plant, which was located in West Lawn PA, out of McKean County. Um, charcoal, wood alcohol, and acetate, uh, or rather, I'm sorry, acidic acid were produced there at that plant. The opportunity to operate a boarding house near the plant in West Line became available a year later, and the two of them decided to acquire it and have Mary keep the borders. They planned to move in on December 7, 1937, but it had to be put on hold because Mary went to the hospital to have their first child. Upon her release, a few days later, the new family went to the boarding house and moved in. And Mary recalled, when I got home with my new baby, I found eight boarders staring at me, and I stared at them. I wondered what I was getting myself into. But much like her mom, Rose, had done so long in Jericho, Mary rolled up her sleeves, baby in arms, and began to cook three meals a day, doing laundry, and caring for the newborn. So her life had changed, changed, changed dramatically five years later, in 1942. The United States entered World War II, and the departure of men from military service caused huge labor shortages. Many women, including Mary, stepped up to the challenge to take on jobs traditionally held by men. Her husband, Joe, had two logging trucks that were used to haul wood to the chemical plant, but with the departure of the men in the area, he had only one driver left himself. Mary decided she wanted to drive one of the trucks, but Joe insisted it was a man's job and she couldn't do it. Mary was determined and learned how to drive the truck. So a year later, this is what she said. Doctor, if you wouldn't mind. She said, the first day was rough. You had to manually lift the wood and pile it on the truck. My arms were so sore and ate so badly, I could hardly sleep at night. The soreness lasted about three or four weeks, and then it got better. As I'm only five foot tall, to reach the pedals of the log truck, I shoved the seat up as far as possible uh, to see out the window. I used pillows to sit on. And I also drove the school bus, and that's a picture of her with the school bus she drove there on the right. So as I also drove school bus, my sister Gertie and Margie Patrick would help me with the boarders and my children. So she's still operating the boarding house. She has several children. She's driving a school bus and also plans to drive a, a log truck. So she would leave West Line at 7.30, 
bus the children to school at Lafayette and then return home by 8.45 to drive the log truck to meet run where our wood job is located. Job would, Joe would have one truck already loaded. I would drive it to the chemical plant, unload the wood by hand, drive the empty truck back to me, run, and return with another load of wood. When I finished unloading, it was time to drive the school bus back to Lafayette to pick up the children, and my husband would bring in the last load of wood at 5 p.m. So she was up in the morning, in the bus, driving kids to school, then back to get the truck, drive that empty one out, pick up a, a load, drive it to the and her five foot frame, trying to unload everything. Drive it back, get another load, drive that back, unload it again, drive back again, get the bus, drive the kids, and then she's finally home. And as we all know, she's not done because there's the kids and everything at home. Um, those were grueling days, but she apparently loved it. Perhaps if you wouldn't mind. So after the war, uh, Mary continued to haul wood to chemical plants and to paper mills until the mid 1960s. You can see here the load is tinier than her. So this really gives you an appreciation for what she's doing. Her husband Joe beside her. So looking back on her life years later, she said, "I have seen changes over the decades in the lumbering world. Today there are eye goggles, chaps, hard hats, earplugs, special footwear. We have none of these." Today, there are sophisticated machinery to take a tree down, chainsaws, skitters. We use two-man cross-cut saw saws, sledges, hammers, horses with sleds to get the wood out. In the late 30s, my log truck dashboard contained a temperature, oil, and gas gauge. I had a simple clutch with a hand emergency brake. If you wanted to stop, I would manually pump and pump those brakes. The back bed was a wooden rack for a manually loaded 15-inch pieces, a 52 inch pieces, three racks long by five high, five feet high, to make a load of wood worth two and a half to three cords split. My old truck had four tires. Today's trucks have everything imaginable on the dashboard, even telephones and air conditioning. The beds are constructed of steel with manufactured mechanical loaders, and instead of four tires, they have 12, which can carry tons of wood on a load which took you a week to produce in the early days of lumbering, can now be accomplished in one day. So speaking of accomplishments, what Mary and the other women I mentioned today accomplished is amazing. Through determination, hard work, and drive, they step into male-dominated domains to gain employment, raise families, face dangers and hardships, and push for change. The work of acquiring and serving land started by Myron Lloyd Doss has resulted in state forest growing to 2.2 million acres of forest land. This forest land supports water and air purification, plant and animal habitat, recreational opportunities, as well as providing economic benefits through timber production and manufacturing. Today's sustainable practices have resulted in PA having more forests than it did 100 years ago. And the revenues from Pennsylvania's lumber industry exceed $5.5 billion annually. So the lumber industry continues to be extremely male dominated, but because of the hard work and examples of these women who have come before, women today are making inroads into all aspects of the industry, from managing the forests to cutting the trees and manufacturing countless wood products. Many private hardwood companies are family owned. So just like the women at logging camps in the past, women are playing crucial roles in management, but doing so from the shadows. Myra would be pleased that Pennsylvania women hold impactful roles in both the U.S. and Pennsylvania forest agencies, like Ellen Schultz Barger, who is the Associate Deputy Chief of the U.S. Forest Service, and Cindy Adams Dunn, who is the Secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. At the uh, Pennsylvania Lumber Museum, we're still learning about the women who historically live and work in PA's forests. Their stories are important and help us understand and share a more complete and inclusive history with our visitors. I really enjoyed putting together today's presentation. Much of my information has come from a recent diversity research study uh, conducted by the Lumber Heritage Region. Um, we are also fortunate that a large portion of Pennsylvania's lumbering payday coincided with the age of photography. So we are rich in historic images. 
For me, it's hard to imagine the difficulty of transporting heavy photographic equipment, glass plates, and chemicals out to the remote locations to document the lives of the men and women living and working there. We are so glad for those photographers who did. And as an aside, I originally put together today's program uh, a few months ago for uh, in the virtual presentation I did for the Susan B. Anthony Museum and House, which is located in Rochester, New York. So previous to coming here to the Lumber Museum, I lived in Rochester for many years. So I have a really long friendship with staff there at the museum. And so while doing research, I made an unexpected discovery linking Susan B. Anthony, that world famous woman suffrage leader, to William C. Clark. Yes, this is funny. Um, William C. Clark uh, thought to be this photograph of him here, the possible self portrait. He was a prolific lumber photographer whose images we hear at the museum piece throughout and I've been using throughout in my presentation. And as it turns out, he and Susan B. Anthony were once neighbors. Um, in 1851, his family moved to a house at 6 Mechanic Square in Rochester, and later moved to a house at 6 Madison Square Park South, where he was born in 1859. The old city directories and street maps from Rochester reveal that these two addresses were actually the same location. A small park across the street from the Clark's home, which is still standing there on the right, um, had several different names over the years. And that resulted in the streets that were surrounding the park to have been renamed. So it was first known as Mechanic Park. By 1874, it was renamed Madison Square Park. And by 1971, it was renamed again as Susan B. Anthony Square in honor of the famous Dr. Lizzie B. lived right around the corner. So it's unknown what sort of relationship the Clark and Anthony family might have had, beyond perhaps a friendly greeting, you know, between neighbors as they passed. But it's fascinating to think about. William would have been a young man when the 39-year-old Susan moved around the corner in 1865. Susan was already quite famous at that point, having been active in the abolition as well as the women's rights movement for many years. As a young adult, William worked uh, as a few years um, in Rochester itself as a photographer for a publisher of serial cards um, before he eventually moved down here to Northern PA sometime in the late 1880s. And then he would spend the next three decades down here uh, photographing lumber camps, sawmills, wood hits. Susan spent those years continuing her fight for women's suffrage until she died in 1906. William would eventually go back to Rochester in 1918 to live with his sister in the family home, and he passed away there in 1930 at the age of 71 due to heart disease. Um, so both he and Susan B. Anthony are buried in Rochester's very beautiful Mount Earth Cemetery, not beside each other, uh, as I had to hunt him down. He was quite well documented as to her location. Um, how unexpected to find such an unlikely connection between these two very different historic figures, but I'm happy that I was able to bring them together, and I'm happy to have brought the stories of some of these uh, formerly forgotten women uh, from our lumbering past to you today. Um, I want to thank you for attending, both in person and those of you joining virtually, um, and if anyone has any questions at this time, I'd be happy to answer them. Josh, turn it over. And anyone uh, watching virtually, if you'd uh, like to uh, ask a question or anyone in the audience, feel free. I have been so very thorough. Uh, and that's all right. Um, 